There are some things that I am glad that they are new, uh, but there are some things that I'm glad that we keep that are old. And uh, those old hymns of the faith, I'm so glad. We're in a time now where there have been so many new songs that many people that listen to the new songs only uh, don't know any of the old, hong, old hymns. And so now, uh, for them, it could be brand new. And uh, so be thankful for all that you have. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 is where we'll begin just to use that verse to keep us in accordance with where we're at. And then we'll jump back to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and we'll cover verses 3 through 12 this evening. It says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. All things new is the title of the message we've been preaching. And we're going back to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3 through 12 this evening. We've so far seen a new perspective. When all things become new, you have a new perspective. And the first perspective you see is before salvation. That is that, boy, I am lost and I am in desperate need of a Savior. And after that new perspective is seen and we become new, new creatures in Christ, we see things from a whole different life. And from that perspective comes a new determination. I'm going to live not as my own. I'm going to live as the Lord leads and as the Lord guides. And, and that means different things to many different people. Some people God sets aside to be in ministry, and some, uh, sometimes God sets people aside to minister, though they will never, uh, it will never be their vocation, if you will. Uh, though I, you know I have the conviction that once you are saved, you are in full-time ministry. There's no part-time Christianity. There's no secret, secret service Christianity. Uh, there are those that stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. Even those that live in countries where you can't openly, there are people we support that we have to be careful even how much we put out there, uh, but they are living boldly for the Lord uh, in their culture, though they may not be able to do things the way you and I do it, uh, they still can live boldly for the Lord as the Lord leads them. Uh, then with determination, new perspective comes a new approach. How do we approach things? How do we approach sin? How do we approach God? How do we approach this life? How do we approach relationships? Then there's a new commendation that we have. And that brings us to a new covenant, a new covenant. And he speaks of this in 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. It's interesting, you think to yourself, well, doesn't that kind of take us back to the very beginning? Yes, it does. Uh, but yet our life is lived in, in view of this new covenant. Uh, remember the old covenant, I'm, and pray for me, I'm trying to keep all of my thoughts uh, in a row, if you will. It's all in there, just getting it out to you to where it doesn't sound like a, a shambled mess is uh, where the challenge is going to be at. But here we are given this new covenant. For what? The old covenant that was given before, they had the law by which they lived. And you and I look at the law and see it as our, our schoolmaster or as a, a mirror to reveal uh, the true filth that our life is. And so there was given this new or better covenant that Hebrews 8 talks about. We'll talk about that a little later. And that is Jesus Christ. He came to fulfill all those things that the law demanded to become the perfect sacrifice for my sins and for your sins. And this old covenant that only leads to burden, sorrow, and death is now given way to a better covenant, a perfect covenant, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in this new covenant, we have a new way to live our life. Now, in the Bible, there are several covenants that God establishes or gives with people. And if you would think about these covenants as puzzle pieces, uh, think about the covenants as puzzle pieces to the outside of the puzzle. And when you're building a puzzle, you don't often begin with the beginning or the middle. You usually try to find the outside pieces first. Set a parameter by which you're going to build this puzzle and build off of that. Now, every once in a while, you'll see some pieces as you're building. Oh, this goes with this. And you might have random pieces, but a good strategy to build a puzzle quickly is to start with the outside pieces. And so the covenants really are, and we don't have time to go into these uh, this evening because it's not the purpose of it, but if you were to look at the different covenants and what they mean and what they're trying to say about God, it really sets out the outlining of who God is. And it's going to set the tone throughout the whole entire Bible. And may, may I say this, by the way, never get in the habit of saying uh, that you break your Bible down into Old Testament and New Testament, though there are different things there. Really read your Bible as the Bible, as the whole. Uh, the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is God's revelation of himself to mankind. Whether it's Old Testament or New Testament, it's still God revealing to you himself. And so, though there are principles in the Old Testament, and I like to say this often, I heard this not of my own, I've heard it when I was in Bible college, not all, all the Bible is not written to us, but it is all written for us. Uh, there are times God has 
speaking specifically to a people, or Paul is speaking specifically to a people. And it is not directly to us, but it's all for us. It's all things we need to learn, all things we get from it. So as we're building this puzzle, and, and what I'm saying is when you have a puzzle in front of you, you don't make the puzzle what you want it to be, do you? No, you're building with the pieces that are given to you to make an image that is already determined by the puzzle maker. And so when God is setting this off, he's having this Adamic covenant, he's having the Noahic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, all of these things tell us something about God. You see the, the Noahic covenant talks about God's restraint, really, if you think about it. It talks about how God could have easily just wiped the entire world out, but yet he showed restraint and yet allowed in, allowed Noah to find grace in the eyes of the Lord, and those people were saved, and it was begun again. And so here, we see here now this new covenant that we're going to read about and live in here. So all these covenants are to establish or to uh, a picture that God is trying to make for us. Now, some of these covenants are conditional. Now, the first four covenants would have been unconditional, but then we come to the Mosaic covenant. And here it will be conditional. Before it was God saying, I'm going to do this no matter what you do. This would be an unconditional covenant. I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to multiply your seed. There was no condition in that. God just says, this is what I'm going to do. He says the same thing to Adam and Eve. He says, lay some of these covenants out that are unconditional. But here we get to the Mosaic covenant in Exodus chapter 19 through 24, and it is conditional. Now, I want to give you a little excerpt, if you would, in Exodus chapter 19, verses 3 through 8, to kind of explain this a little bit, all right? So in Exodus chapter 19, verses 3 through 8, it says, And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now, I want to just say, by the way, uh, that that whole thing, and you look at the picture he's just painted for us, by the way, with bearing you out on eagle's wings. Now, when you think of an eagle, you think of something majestic, soaring high above everything else. They're often seen way up in the sky, and I don't know what it is. Even to this day, when I see a bald eagle out in the field, I just go, Merka. I don't know, there's just something about it. They're majestic beings. And here in the Bible, there's, there's no difference. The eagle soaring high above. So you think about what God did to bring Egypt out. You think about those plagues and how uh, basically God's saying, there is no other God but me. Every one of those plagues was to say that God is not powerful. I am powerful. I am the Lord, your God, as it says in Exodus chapter 20, verse number two. I am the Lord, your God. It's the reason we keep the commandments because he says, I am the Lord, your God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. I am the Lord, thy God. You shall not take the Lord's name in vain. I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt not kill. Do you understand? And so he's saying, this is, the, this is the standard by which you live. And so the picture is that as I brought them out majestically, high above, great power, now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, notice it says if, if you obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. Now, reminder, we're reading about what in Sunday morning? We're reading about Jeremiah. What is he telling them? Because they haven't kept the commandments, they haven't kept the covenant, because they haven't loved him, because they've gone into idolatry, he's warning them that they're about to go into 70 years of captivity. So the covenant of these promises and the blessings and being a peculiar people is going to be seen that it is definitely conditional throughout the rest of Scripture. So, um, for all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and holy nation. These are the words thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. Now look at the response. And all the people answered together. So everybody understood the assignment. Everybody understood what they were agreeing to. And he says, all that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. So, they know, they're parameter that out. There's no hidden fees. <laughs> There's nothing secretive about it. It's out in the open. And they say, everything the Lord has said, we will do. Well, they're going to come into judgment because they did not do what they said they would do. 
So what do you think the key word to this Mosaic covenant would be? That word would be to reveal. To reveal. The Mosaic covenant reveals several things to us. It does reveal God's righteousness. But what it's going to do and what Galatians talks to us about is it reveals to us our hopelessness before God. It reveals to us our sinfulness before a holy and righteous God. It reveals to us our absolute despair before a holy and righteous God. It does reveal something to us. And it reveals to us that no matter how good God is and how much we say, Lord, whatever you say, we will do, it shows that we will not do what we say we will do. And it reveals it to us over and over and over and over again. And here we are in the New Testament, right? Do you still struggle with that? Because I do. I say, Lord, I, I, I can tell you right now, I can think of a prayer I've said right here, Lord, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to do that. I don't want to think like that. And I'm going to be real honest with you. I have thought like that since then. I've done that since then. There are some things that have given this altar of prayer and they have stayed there and put up a no fishing sign. But there have been other things that I said, Lord, whatever you tell me to do, I will do. And I didn't do it. See, what I'm saying is this covenant that was given then is different than the covenant that they're speaking about now, this new covenant. It will reveal to mankind, the old covenant will reveal to mankind of sinfulness. The new covenant will reveal to mankind God's ultimate grace. This old covenant will ultimately lead or reveal to us our need for a final or perfect atonement for this work to be done and that it will be fulfilled in Christ. So let's look at a new covenant. Before we even get into that, I want you to look at verse uh, 3, the latter portion of verse 3. But with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. This new covenant is not based upon written tablature, but it really is based upon all of who God is written on your heart. Would you agree with that? Yes or no? All of who God is is now written upon your heart. The Spirit of God says, what you may not understand, I'm going to reveal to you. And so in essence, what we would say is we are ruled by an unseen king. The Bible says that no man has ever seen God. But you and I are ruled by an unseen king. He is certainly active. He is seen in the things that he has done, but you and I have never seen God. The Spirit of God moves inside of us. I've never seen the Spirit of God, but I know he's present. I know when he's at work. I know when he's trying to point something out, and I'm trying my best to ignore it. But we serve an unseen king. God's ultimate desire has always been for us to be ruled under a theocracy. In other words, God has always desired to be our king at all times. If, if it was not so, God would establish from the Garden of Eden that there would have been this, uh, uh, this uh, kingly rule. But God wanted him to be the only God of our heart. Now, there was a time where God was their ruler. And there was a time where the spiritual leaders of that time or there were people that were not walking as they should have. As a matter of fact, in 1 Samuel 8, 3, uh, uh, it says, And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre and took bribes and perverted judgments. So this wasn't exactly this established lead leadership that it should have been. And so the people begged for a king to lead them. 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 20 says, That we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. This is what they wanted. They said, we want a king that's going to go out and represent us and fight our battles. But can I tell you something? They already had that. They already had that. Go with you to Exodus 14 and verse 14. The scene, we've used this verse a lot. I love this story. Here it is, the children of Israel. They're now fleeing from Egypt and they're standing at the Red Sea and they're looking at the Red Sea and thinking to themselves, well, we can't swim that fast. And they're looking back and there's the Egyptian army coming after them. Say, boy, they're a whole lot bigger than us. And then they're looking at Moses saying, were there not enough graves back in Egypt? Uh, wouldn't we have been better off being slaves over there? And this is what Moses says to them in Exodus 14, 14. The Lord shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace. 
They already had a king that was fighting for them. They already had a king that was representing them. They already had a king that was everything they ever needed. But they wanted an earthly king. And how'd that first king work out for them? Not too good. As a matter of fact, there would be very few kings that you, they could look at and say he was a good king. Josiah was a good king. His daddy, not so much. His daddy, not so much. So very few. Just like you can look at the 45, is that where we're at now? Presidents, why am I having a... It doesn't matter. And how many can you look back and say they were good presidents? Not too many. As a matter of fact, if we were to quiz you right now, very few of you would get more than probably six or seven of the presidents. You'd all get Lincoln, Washington, Obama, the guy that's in now. <laughs> Sorry. That's not really his name. He has a name. But anyway, but they had a king. Now, I want to say that God has always desired for his people to be ruled under him. But God has allowed in his generosity for men to rule over men. But ultimately, it's always been God should rule in our hearts. Even today, we have a president, and we have a mayor, and we have other people that we are supposed to be subjected to. However, above those, we are in subjection to God ultimately. We follow our, the rules of the road. We follow the rules laid out for us until it comes in conflict with biblical rule or God's rule, if that makes sense. If it comes in conflict with that, I'm sorry, God's rule wins every single time. That's how God designed it. Why? Because he is greater in all these things. And can I just say this, by the way? Never confuse God's generosity with weakness. I think we do that often sometimes, and unbeknownst sometimes ourselves. We confuse God's generosity and, and equate it to weakness. No, God is merciful. And it says that when his judgment comes, it'll be swift. It may not come swift like time-wise, but when it happens, poof, it'll happen. So we are ruled by an unseen king. But in this new covenant, we are guided by a unique grace. We're guided by a unique grace. Uh, look what it says in verse number five. Um, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. God has given us a unique grace, and this grace is not licensed for us to do what we want, but liberty to live as God has saved us to live. He is consecrated for us in this new covenant, as Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 20 says, a new and living way. You and I live now governed by the Spirit of God. We the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. We're to be filled with the Spirit. And when we're filled with the Spirit, we'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And so this new covenant, this unique grace that we are living under, really to me, even has a, to me a higher standard than the law ever did. And what do I mean by that? By that? Now it is governed by, by love in the sense that before, this is what the law said we did, so we did it. And there was consequences for not following as such. Now, there should be a measure of love, but it was really, don't break these rules. Now, it's the Holy Spirit is dwelling in us, and we don't want to do anything to grieve the Holy Spirit, which speaks of a love relationship. I don't want to grieve you as your friend, as your pastor. I don't want to do those things. Not because I can't do these things. I don't want to. I don't want to, even there are times where I have to tell my children that they can't do something. But I don't want to say that sometimes because I know they'll be upset with me. But I do it anyway. We don't want to grieve the Lord. Paul was not stating here in this upcoming verses that the law didn't have any glory. It did have a glory of its time. But the glory that this new covenant that Jesus brought in would surpass the old glory. Look at verse number six. Who also hath made us able ministers of a new testament, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. 
So what does this tell us? And Paul gives several examples of why the new covenant is superior to the old covenant. Number one, the new covenant glory means spiritual life, not death. Now you think about what the old covenant led to. It showed us our need for salvation. It showed us our wickedness before God. And sin, when it's finished, brings forth what? Death. So ultimately, the law was leading to death. And that's what the scripture says. We'll read here in just a moment. Now, the law itself does not kill. However, it does reveal to us our helpless need before God. Now, Paul states this again in Romans chapter 7 and verse 7. He says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. So he's not saying that the law is sin. For sin is the transgression of the law. But he's saying without this law, I never would have known how deep and how far I had offended God. Have you ever done anything before and thought to yourself, wow, I didn't realize that was the impact of it. Or man, I didn't realize that was how bad it was. Well, you remember, by the way, again, referencing Josiah, what happened to him? They went in and he authorized to have payment for the temple to be rebuilt. And this man comes out and he says, I have found the book. That's what he says, right? And what does he do? He begins to read it, Josiah. And what is Josiah's response? He rents his clothes. He's like, whoa, we are not doing good. How did he find that out? The law. <laughs> they read the law. And by reading the law, he didn't look at the law and say, man, God is so good. Though that was true, he looked at the law and says, we are not doing good. And he starts eliminating all these idol temples and things that were put up by his father, eliminates all that. And he tries to promote people to live godly lives. And he was a good king. Now, we can't talk about that much because we're going to talk about that next week, next week Sunday, all right? But what I'm saying is all of this led to death, but the new covenant leads to life, and the Bible says life everlasting. And Jesus describes it as a, a fountain flowing up in you. He's trying to describe this new life that we're given in Christ. And that's the only way we live this life is in Christ. Not by the letter that killeth, but by the Spirit. Give the Spirit, give it life. Now, he says in verse 7, but... If the ministration of death written and engraved in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather, be rather glorious? So think about what he says. He says, it was glorious. Notice what it says there. But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious, so it was glorious. So glorious that when Moses comes off of the mountain, they can't even look on his face. He is shining bright. And he says, but that glory will be done away. He says, how much more that the gloriousness of this new covenant and the life that's given that is there. And here he's saying this new covenant means glory. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, means spiritual life and not death. Paul further displays the deficiencies of the law to the Judaizers in Galatians. And we're not, we don't have time to go through all this. But he says in Galatians 2.16, it talks about how the law cannot justify the lost sinner. He says in Galatians 2.21 that the law cannot give a sinner righteousness. He says in Galatians 3.2, the law cannot give the Holy Spirit. He says in Galatians 3.18, the law cannot give an inheritance. He says in Galatians 3.21, the law cannot give life. He says in Galatians 4.8 through 10, the law cannot give freedom. So there are all things the law cannot do, it cannot do, it cannot do. But Jesus Christ, God himself, can justify the sinner. Amen. Jesus Christ can make a sinner righteous. The Bible says he who knew sin became sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God gives us the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I'll send you the comforter. The Holy Spirit is given through Jesus Christ. The Bible says that we have an inheritance through Jesus Christ in Christ. Uh, we are given new life in Jesus Christ. And if the Son, therefore, shall make you free, he shall be free indeed. So this new covenant gives all these things that the old covenant could not do. Now, bear in mind, Paul's not saying old covenant bad. It has a purpose. There's a reason God gave it to us. And it still is in effect today. 
that are revealed to every single person their need of salvation. The new covenant, the new covenant is, uh, the new covenant glory means righteousness, righteousness, not condemnation. Look at verses 9 and 10. For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. So the old covenant was deemed to condemnation to show the filth as it were on our faces. When you go out and I, I have a four-wheeler and used to go out and we still go out and we go riding and, and sometimes it's real dusty or muddy. The first thing you want to do, you don't wash up. You go look in the mirror to see how nasty you got. It's like a little badge of honor. If you take off the glasses and you got a clean spot and everything else, your I got a picture of my wife. Her teeth are disgusting because all dirt and everything in there. It's, it's nasty, but it's awesome because that's the point. We want to go out and ride. And so when we read our Bible, read our Bible, and it's the mirror, and you know what you see back? Teeth, edges full of dirt everywhere. But thanks be to God that through Christ, he goes, and wipes it all away. So the new covenant means righteousness and not condemnation. The new covenant is righteousness, which is in Christ. And Paul further speaks of his new life and that it did not come by the way of the law. Now, I remember in Galatians 20, he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I live now in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Well, that next verse, which we don't read very often, says this. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And he makes it very clear. He says, if righteousness could come by the law, I'd be there already. And Christ, really, it would have been pointless for him to be here at all. That's a pretty big statement. So our righteousness comes through him. Many people don't feel holy and they don't feel good unless they're carrying some weight or burden of religion. Do you understand what I mean? Like, I have to do this to be holy. I have to be here to be righteous. Do, 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 do. And don't get me wrong. Those are just reflections of the inward man. I don't do what I do to be holy. I do what I do because Christ has made me holy and I want to be an example of a believer. Amen. I want to display the glory of God in this new life. There are things that I don't do in my new truck that I did in my old truck. This one actually gets washed. <laughs> the other one didn't. I'd like to say I don't eat in my truck, but that's not true but I definitely watch what I eat and how I eat it. Well, my wife opened up a bag of popcorn, more than one, let's just leave it at that. Uh, I just watched her like a hawk, and I'd watch a piece hit her mouth and fall down, and I'm driving going, she's like, I got it. I'm like, you better. Now, talk a couple years, and she opens the bag, and it just spills out where like, we'll see. But right now, it's new. You take care of it. And he says, this new life, it should be a reflection of, or the life I live should be a reflection of the life I have. <clears throat> now, this new life and grace is given in this new covenant is so powerful, our righteousness is in Christ. Now, this does not negate our obligation to live holy and righteous. Romans 6, 1 and 2 says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that great abound? And God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And James ends out, James chapter 2, verse 26, for the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. So, so the new life should display a new life. Amen? Now the glory of the old cannot compare with the glory of new. Look at verse 10. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that exceeded, excelleth. Now think about that. He says that there was glory in the, the old covenant. He said but that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect. In other words, nothing can compare to Jesus. Amen. Nothing can compare to what Jesus did, what he accomplished, the power that's given to every person, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He says nothing can compare to it. And that is true. Now, 
The law produces guilt and condemnation. For it's like the, the, the bond of indebtedness that, that we read about in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14. It says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. There was a, a debt that we owed that we could not pay. There was a burden in it. It's seen as the guardian who disciplined us that we see in Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. It's seen this old covenant as seen as a yoke too heavy to bear, as we see in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty where Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Acts chapter 15 and verse 10 speaks and says, Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither your fathers nor we are able to? To bear. So this old covenant is recognized or linked up with condemnation. But the new covenant speaks of freedom and glory. The new covenant is permanent and not temporary. Now Paul's writing in a period where these two things are overlapping. Look at verse 11. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Think about that. When he's writing this, there are, there would have been still uh, there would have been still like Jews practicing and all that. AD 70, Jerusalem, the temple was destroyed and all that was done, stopped, ceased. But there was a time where Jesus is preaching. He's preaching of this new way, but yet still people were going in the temple. And that's what the problem with the Galatians was. These Judaizers were just trying to bring people back into this like mixed form of worship. Like, yeah, 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 Jesus. Oh, amen, Jesus, Jesus. However, you still need to do this. You still need to be circumcised. You still need to do this. That was a problem. That was the whole problem they were trying to, that they were dealing with. It is about mixed uh, worship. It's about pure worship in this better covenant that was laid out for us. Go to Hebrews chapter 8. Hold your place there. Hebrews chapter number 8. We're going to look briefly at verses 6 through 13. And this message in Hebrews was reiterated for us in Jeremiah 31, speaking of this better covenant. We don't have time to go there, but if you want to write that reference down in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. There had been a herald that there was going to be this better covenant. Ezekiel talked about this better covenant. And here Hebrews talks about it, starting in verse number 6. It says, But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, but how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been all this, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Notice he specifically says with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. We'll talk about that in a moment. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith, a new covenant, he hath made the first old, now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Now, very clear language there, vanishing away, done away. And he says this new covenant. But notice he talks about in the very beginning there was a mediator. Now, on Mount Sinai, who was the mediator between God and the people? Moses. He was their mediator. He was the go-between. He was the one who they begged him, we, we don't want to speak to God, we, we'll die. And Moses went, and he spoke to them, and he came and re rehearsed that message back from the Lord to them. Now, who is our mediator now? Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Timothy, for there is only one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. He is the only mediator that you and I have. And so now our go-between is no longer a man in this earth, or a human man, but it is the God-man, Jesus Christ, making intercession now. We go boldly before the throne of grace now in Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ died, what happened to the veil? Uh, what happened to the veil? It was torn from where? Top to bottom, which is very interesting. From God down to man, it was torn. 
Now, this veil was not like your house curtain. It was extremely thick. It was extremely heavy. And what was in that, past that curtain, what was that? That was the Holy of Holies, wasn't it? That only was entered into by specific and certain people. And so now God sends the message that Jesus Christ has come. And now you and I can come to God ourselves through the merit of Jesus Christ. Amen. Notice that he says here. He says specifically that he is going to, uh, verse 10, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. And then he also says specifically to Israel and to Judah in verse number 8, doesn't he? So how does this be? How is this, how is this happening? I think, and I would believe, that it's captured perfectly in Romans chapter 1 and verse number 16. Go with me to Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. And Paul writes this. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Now what's the gospel? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. When Jesus Christ came and began to minister on this earth, who did he go to first? The Jews. Matthew chapter 15, verse 24. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. When Jesus sent his disciples out, who did he send them out to first? The Jews. He says in Acts chapter uh, 1 and verse 8, he says, and ye shall be witnesses. He says, go to Jerusalem first is what he says. When Peter gives his message at Pentecost, he says in Acts chapter 2 and verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So he is sending a message to the Jew first, but also to the Greek, also to the Gentile. Sometimes we take the, the Bible and we try to spiritualize things that if we do that, we get in a lot of trouble. Because then you got to start spiritualizing other things that are of like manner. And then when does it stop? That's when you get into some crazy doctrine. This is why we have to rightly divide the word of truth. Amen. We have to look at it and say, okay, God, what is he he's saying here? Does this make us spiritual Israel? Does this make us this? Or is he saying there is a message coming and God's sending it to the Jew first, which he did, but also to the Greek, to the, the rest of the world, to hear this message. God's people had rejected Jesus, but this new covenant was open to whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord. The new covenant that was established in Christ offers freedom and life. It truly brings us to a place of all things new. I want to close out with... Um, verse number 12 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says, For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf that ye may have somewhat to answer. I, why am I not? This does not look great. That's why I'm not right. Sorry. I'm in 517, three. That does not look right. I'm like, that does not look right. <laughs> Verse 12, thank you for chapter three. Ooh, that hot feeling when you're like, this does not look right, but try to fight through it, but then you know it's not right. Verse 12, here we go. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. So the freedom we have in this new covenant, the new life we've given, gives us plainness of speech. We can easily say, listen, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Christ said that he came to die for the sinners of the world, who Paul proclaims, I am chief. We can speak with plainness of speech. The new covenant gives us a new perspective, a new determination. There's a new commendation we have. And we live in this new covenant. It's the better covenant, the one that's eternal, the one that leads to righteousness, not condemnation. Our new life is in Christ. 
And it is part of how we live this life all, with all things new. 